Hello and uh, welcome to this uh, third of the series of uh, presentations on uh, food science, specifically uh, in the context of Indian cooking. Uh, the first one was uh, about uh, rasam and the second one was about samba. And this one is about that third category of side dish uh, that is ubiquitous. Uh, in, in a lot of South Indian cooking, known by different names, but I'm going to use the Tamil name in this context, uh, the art and science of Kutu. Right? Uh, this is coming from a lengthy conversation that I've had with uh, my 80-year-old grandna, grandaunt, who's a fantastic cook. And for this particular uh, uh, presentation, I also talked to several other people uh, who are good cooks in the family. And also watched a ton of YouTube videos uh, because this is uh, this is a spectacularly diverse category of dishes, uh, unlike rasam or sambar, which you know which have some variations. But uh, kutu, on the other hand, is a spectacularly diverse. I mean, you can make kutu from literally anything. Uh, and so, uh, for this uh, particular video, I did see a fair number of YouTube videos just to get a sense of of this diversity. So let me get into the art and science of Kutu, I'm going to give you a quick recap of the things that I've spoken about in my previous presentation. Right. Uh, the first one was about Rasam. Uh, and the second one was about Kurambu. More specifically, we spoke about Sambar, but Sambar is a, a, a specific instantiation of a broader category of uh, dish called Kurambu. Right? So, uh, rasam is a watery broth with a mild flavor profile. It is uh, the dominant flavor in a rasam is sour. Right? It's usually made from tamarind. You could make them entirely from really sour tomatoes, but generally it uses tamarind. And the key to getting a milder flavor profile is to boil spices in the tamarind water as opposed to fry the spices in oil, right? Again, as a general rule, spices cooked in oil, more intense. Spices boiled in water, less intense, right? So that's the general rule. So in the second presentation, we spoke about uh, sambar specifically, which is a one, one specific instance of a kurumbu. Uh, a kurumbu is a thick stew with a strong flavor profile, right? It's way more intense from a flavor standpoint than a rasam. It's also thicker, right? Uh, the dominant flavor is both sour and hot, right? So it tends to use uh, chili powder. Uh, and in fact, sambar powder tends to have coriander and chilies as the dominant spice with other spices sort of playing secondary roles, right? Um, in case of a kurumba, spices are both boiled in some situations and cooked in other situations. Again, entirely depending on what kind of flavor and which spices you want to be more intense. Right? So it's possible uh, that you might sort of use a cook in oil approach to say coriander and chilies to get a very strong flavor uh, while boiling garlic to get a milder flavor. Or you could do it the other way around as well. right? Uh, so a garlic kurumba might have a dominant garlic flavor. So you might actually want to mince the garlic and fry it in oil as opposed to simply boiling the garlic, which will give you a milder garlic flavor. Okay. Uh, as we said, kurumba with tur dal as the protein is usually called sambar okay, in the southern states. The more common form of kurumba, at least in the coastal uh, parts of Tamil Nadu, is fish kurumba or bean kurumba, right? Uh, you follow the exact same recipe and at the time when you need to add the dal, you add the fish. Uh, fish again cooks pretty quickly, uh, not too dissimilar from already pressure cooked dal. So it's quite common to make the kurumba and then add the fish towards the last five minutes uh, to get a bean kurumba. And you could do this uh, with other forms of protein, uh, mutton, poultry, beef and pork. Each of them, of course, will require separate uh, kinds of preparation. Uh, chicken is something that you might want to cook right in the gravy all the way from the start. 
uh, whereas mutton, uh, beef and pork generally tend to be pressure cooked before adding to the gravy because they take a longer time to cook, right? So kurambu is a broad template of a thick uh, stew, a thick gravy, which is primarily tamarind based. And uh, it has some form of protein, which, you know, obviously the one with turdal is called sambar. Uh, the ones with uh, fish is called mean kurambu. And then you have various other variants as well, okay? Now, so having seen both of these category of dishes, the dish that we will be talking about today is the third, and I would actually argue uh, a, the, the most diverse family of dishes or what's called kutu uh, in, in Tamil, right? So kutu is essentially a thick lentil and vegetable stew with a mild flavor profile, right? So you sort of see how the meal gets balanced, right? So you have rasam, which is a mild watery broth, more like a soup. Uh, you have kurambu or sambar, which is a thick stew with a strong flavor profile. Then you have a kutu, which is a mild uh, flavored lentils and vegetable stew. Right. So these are the sort of, uh, and then you have a fourth category of dish, which is entirely dry uh, sabji, and we'll we'll get to that at some point of time. Right. So again, the interesting thing about the kutu is that its dominant flavor is generally nutty and the flavor of whatever is your main ingredient. You typically make kutu with one main ingredient in addition to the dal, uh, and that's the flavor you want. Uh, but again, there are kutu that, uh, kutus that use multiple ingredients as well, but uh, yeah, you know, in food there are no rules, but broadly, typically uh, kutu is made out of one main ingredient, right? And that's the primary flavor you see, and it's generally mild because you're not overwhelming it with spices. Uh, and the reason for this is is also simple. You usually make a kutu when you have one of the other. Uh, you either have a sambar or you have a rasam and you have something else that is strongly flavored. So this adds a sense of balance. So you have a milder flavor because if you have two dishes that are intensely strongly flavored. It's sort of, you know, overload uh, on your taste buds, right? So, so the other thing is that, again, this is not a general rule, but typically the, the lentils used in a kutu tends to be mung dal. For a very simple reason, mung dal cooks very quickly, right? And it generally tends to cook at the same time as the vegetables that are being used along with the, the mung dal. So you could cook both of them together in a pressure cooker, right? So that way they get cooked at the same time and one isn't overcooked or undercooked. So they cook together in roughly about the same time, right? So that's the reason why mung dal typically tends to be used, but there is no such rule. Of course, you can use any lentils. Uh, you might have to adjust your cook times. You might have to cook them separately and so on. Uh, there's another little bit of uh, 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 little bit of history to this that uh, that my grand aunt told me, is that uh, the popularity of kutu as a dish is also a relatively modern phenomenon, uh, in that it really represents uh, a dish that you can churn out in under five to six minutes, right? Uh, the simplest kutu just involves a chopped vegetable, cooked mung dal, and a tempering, which essentially means that you could make this dish in under five minutes, right? Again, a boon for the first generation of working women uh, who had to sort of balance uh, a home and, and office and work and studies. And this is something that would let you, uh, the modern amenities in the sense of uh, a pressure cooker, uh, and the fact that you had a refrigerator, which means that you could grate coconuts a little ahead of time and store it at least for two, three days. Uh, and then uh, you would uh, use things like the, the mixie or the blender to grind the coconut in case you're using coconut in your kota and obviously the pressure cooker itself. So in some sense, this is one of those dishes that in the presence of, you know, what we would consider to be commonplace, but, you know, maybe about 30 or 40 years ago, considered to be advanced modern equipment in the Indian kitchen, which is namely the refrigerator, uh, the mixie blender or uh, the pressure cooker. Each three of them came together to help you make a kutu, uh, which is a dish you could make in under five minutes, right? Historically, cooking always took time. There was no dish that you could make in five or 10 minutes. Uh, it still involved a fair amount of work. Uh, things still took time to cook on a regular sort of a wood fired uh, stuff and so on. So this is one of those dishes uh, that is pretty popular in working families uh, where you can just quickly whip up something uh, with very little time. So that's that's another bit of background to that. Uh, the nutty flavor uh, comes from a combination of roasting urad dal till it's brown, uh, 
which is one of the primary textures uh, in a kurta and grated coconut, which is again optional, right? So, so this, as I said, it's the fastest, easiest gravy to make. Sambar takes time because uh, tamarind takes time uh, to cook. So one big thing here is the fact that kurta typically, uh, and again, this is not a general rule, typically does not have any acid, right? So it does not have a sour taste profile. But if you like a sour taste profile, by all means, you can add some tomatoes, you can add a little bit of tamarind water as well, right? So that's the, so there's a kurta is the family of dishes that essentially, you know, really no rules. Uh, the sheer variety across the southern states is is is, is tremendously large. Okay? So uh, essentially, having looked at all these categories of kurta, I broke it down into just two simple categories, right? So one is that there's a simple kurta, which is uh, you you pressure cook lentils and vegetables or boil them, depending on you know whatever you have in your kitchen, right? And then once you're done with that, you temper with urad dal chilies and jeera. Of course, you have to add salt and all that, but yes, that's pretty much, this is the simplest kutu. And as you will see, there are combinations of vegetables and moong dal and just this tempering and salt still makes for a delicious dish, right? Not an overly intense flavored dish, but something that is still tremendously tasty, right? This is the, this is your five minute dish, if you will. But of course, uh, the puricha or archivitta kutu is slightly more sophisticated uh, in that you do the pressure cooking of lentils and vegetables together, typically mung dal and some vegetables or mung dal and spinach and so on. Uh, you oil roast lentils, chilies, jeera, pepper and grind it to a paste with coconut. This is a, you know, if you remember the sambar chapter, this is not very dissimilar from arachivita sambar except that uh, coriander uh, also tends to be used to get a sambar kind of flavor, whereas here, if you want to distinguish it from a sambar, you, you generally don't use coriander. Nothing stopping you from using coriander here. It will taste more like sambar uh, if you do so. That's perfectly fine though, right? And then you temper. So as you, again, as you see, if you go back to the flavor layering principles that we've been speaking about in these, uh, the videos that I've been putting out. So again, if you oil roast spices and then grind them, you get a very intense uh, flavor, right? And that's which you are now sort of tempering with uh, with coconut, right? Which makes it a little bit more creamy and smoother and less spicy and so on. And then you are tempering with another layer of flavoring, which is your urad dal, mustard, jeera, and curry leaves at the end. So you now you have two layers of flavor, uh, one very intense and one is the tempering. And that lends this entire uh, arachivit takuto is a, is a slightly more strongly flavored, uh, you know, sort of a dish compared to a simple kutu, right? So these are the two broad varieties of kutu, right? Now, having looked at multiple uh, videos uh, and uh, of kutu recipes from everywhere. So essentially, let's really look at the algorithm for how you'd make approach a kutu. So again, there's a base, there's uh, lentils plus veggies, there is flavoring, there's garnish and tempering, okay? Now, uh, in general, obviously you would saute whatever base you have in oil, and then you would add the lentils and veggies, you could pressure cook them separately. Or in some cases, uh, you might cook the vegetable along with your base, and you would pressure cook the dal separately. I mean, either way is fine. But the basic idea is that you need to get lentils and vegetables, cook them together and somehow add them to the dish. You know, however you do it is fine, right? And then you have a flavoring, uh, which, you, which you again, in, in the case where you're oil roasting, uh, and grinding to a paste, you, you grind it to a paste, add it, cook it only briefly because it's you've already oil roasted it, the spices are already cooked, uh, you don't need to cook them for too long in the dish, right? Uh, and then there's a garnish and tempering. Again, my personal preference is that uh, I like the taste of coconut oil uh, to bring about an extra layer of flavor, but of course you can use ghee, you can use any kind of oil, frankly, okay? Uh, so I'm gonna take an example of what is the simplest, absolute dead simple five minute dish, which is the uh, chow chow kutu. Uh, chow chow is, uh, is a vegetable uh, whose Hindi name I don't know, but um, in English it's called the chayote squash. Um, and um, it, it sort of looks like a bottle, it's green. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's basically a squash vegetable, right? Now, you take, you chop the, uh, the chayote squash or the chow chow, don't throw away the peel, by the way. You can use the peel to make chutney, uh, a fantastically tasty chutney. So don't throw away the peel. 
uh, is you take the vegetable, chop it into uh, small chunks. Uh, you pressure cook with moong dal um, together. And then you just add salt, open the pressure cooker, add salt, add a little bit of water if you want. Um, cook, let it cook for a bit. There's no flavoring here other than salt, right? And then you temper with urad dal, jeera and red chilies. It's uh, generally try and get the urad dal to become reasonably brown, but not too brown yeah, or, or it's, it's, it's getting burnt. Uh, so this is your simple chow chow kuta. I mean, this is literally something that you could put together in five minutes. And notice how there's actually no base at all. You start, you start in this case, straight with the pressure cooked moon dal um, and the chopped vegetable in this case, right? Um, let me take another example of something that I had today, right? This is the uh, watermelon rind. It's summer. Uh, so all of you are going to get watermelon, right? Uh, and normally you will throw away the uh, the the white rind uh, before the, the pink, the, the juicy sweet bits start, right? Do not. It's absolutely delicious as a vegetable, right? It's the same pumpkin family. So it doesn't taste too different from pumpkin with a slight hint of sweetness. Uh, that's fantastic, right? So in fact, you do the same thing. You pressure cook the mung dal and the chopped watermelon rind. And because that uh, rind has a slight sweet taste profile for flavoring, you just add salt and just chop one green chili directly into the broth, in, uh, into the cooking vessel. Uh, let it cook for a bit and then you temper with urad dal, jeera and red chilies, right? So this is, uh, this is another example of a dead simple uh, kutub, again, a dish that you could make in less than five minutes. Now, now let's get to slightly more sophisticated variations of this. Uh, the first of which is the, the cabbage kutu or cabbage puricha kutu. Okay? Uh, in this case, what you're going to do is chop the cabbage and pressure cook along with mung dal. Uh, I think I have a bit of a copy paste error here, but yeah, so it's, it's cabbage. Um, and then for flavoring, you add salt and you also roast urad dal, jeera, pepper, chilies, along with coconut and grind it to a paste and then add curry leaves for garnish and then your usual tempering, right? This makes for a fantastic uh, side dish uh, even for roti as well, right? Not just not just for rice, right? It makes for a, I mean, sort of like a, uh, a cabbage infused dal, if you will, right? Uh, along with coconut and all these other spices. Okay? So this is, uh, so this is, uh, this is cabbage porchakota, right? Now, um, you could do this uh, with uh, with spinach as well. And in case of spinach, because spinach literally has no taste, uh, uh, unlike say cabbage or uh, watermelon rind or say chow chow, uh, you might want to add a little bit more flavor when you're making spinach puruchakuta where you heat oil, add some shallots and then cook the spinach along with the, after the sh after the shallots are cooked. So you, you get that sort of onion flavor um, into the dish as well. Otherwise this will be completely tasteless, right? Um, and then obviously you can uh, you can do the whole uh, salt and uh, oil roasted uh, urad dal, jeera, pepper, chilies, coconut paste, uh, and then temper. Right. So this is your spinach uh, puricha kote, except now you have a base as well. Right. So as I said, this is a this is a dish where there are many variants. The simple variant and the most sophisticated variant have a tremendous uh, amount of difference uh, in both flavor profile uh, as well as you know how long it takes to make. So uh, let me take, uh, now going out of Tamil Nadu, let me take one example of a style of kutu uh, that I've seen in, in Karnataka, right? So here's here's a difference. Uh, one, in this case, it's not moong dal, you're using tur dal, okay? Tur dal takes a slightly longer time to cook unless you soak the tur dal for about half an hour, in which case you reduce the cook time to roughly the same as what it might take, uh, whatever vegetables you want to uh, pressure cook, right? Moong dal, on the other hand, does not require soaking. Um, it will typically just pressure cook in about the same time as vegetables. Tur dal, you might want to soak ahead of time so that you can get it down to the same time. And in this particular case, this is a very rich kutu with lots of vegetables, uh, uh, beans and potato and, and peanuts. Peanuts, incidentally, are also legumes. Peanuts are not nuts, right? Uh, and then it also has peas and pumpkin, which, by the way, if you try and cook it with everything, will get completely smashed. Uh, so peas and pumpkin are cooked separately um, in this case, right? Once you've pressure cooked all of this, this is one thing. On the other side, flavoring, you're doing the same thing, except that in this case, instead of using urad dal, you're using chana dal, urad dal, jeera, pepper, coriander, chilies, and grinding it to a paste with coconut. So this has a slightly more sambar-like 
uh, sort of flavor profile as well. Also, uh, use a bit of jaggery to balance out uh, the taste in this case, and a little bit of tamarind extract. So, as I said, no rules here, right? So, you, a little bit of tamarind extract, and you uh, you cook this entire flavoring a bit, and add all the cooked tur dal and all these vegetables. Add a little bit of water, let it come to a boil, and then you add curry leaves and temper with urad dal, jeera, red chilies. Right. So, this is a Kannada Karnataka style kutu uh, that that I've seen on uh, some people cook, right? Um, I'll give you one another example uh, of uh, another region in this case, the Chettinad spinach kutu. Again, interesting. This has a strong garlic flavor profile. So as you can see in the in the base, you heat oil, uh, typically uh, sesame oil in case of Chettinad. Uh, fennel seeds are very important in Chettinad food. Shallots, chilies, and garlic, right? Uh, and then you add the spinach to this, and so let it sort of cook till it wilts. And then you add the pressure cooked moong dal add salt, and then you temper with urad dal, mustard, curry leaves, garlic, red chilies, and fennel, right? So you're again, the, the taste that you're primarily highlighting here is garlic. Um, and that is something that will sort of stand out um, in this specific sort of chetinat spinach uh, based kutu, right? So as you can see, uh, kutu is relatively significantly simple. Uh, every kind of kutu is way simpler to make uh, than most of the dishes uh, in, in the South Indian uh, sort of uh, cooking uh, traditions in, in all of these South Indian states, right? Uh, but so I thought I'll take a little bit of a, a detour now. Uh, given that pressure cooking features prominently in making kutus, right? Uh, I thought I'll sort of do a small detour uh, on pressure cooking itself and on the science of pressure cooking, which is that I think a lot of people uh, tend to kind of get pressure cooking wrong, uh, not in the sense of cooking their food badly, but I think they mostly underutilize their pressure cooker and sometimes uh, don't quite realize that measuring pressure cooking in whistles uh, is inaccurate, right? So in brief, how a pressure cooker works is, is the fact that typically when you cook food, you have two ways of cooking food, right? You can either cook food directly uh, in a pan uh, or you could add water and cook it. Right. Uh, what cooking in water essentially does is that it offers you a protection against food getting burnt because metal tends to get really hot uh, and water is not a great conductor of heat. And, uh, and the other thing is that water boils off uh, at about 100 Celsius. So your temperature will never go above 100 Celsius because by then the, the water would have evaporated and you know, you'd know that it's evaporating. Right. So in, in, a, in the gentle sense, human, mankind has been cooking uh, with water. Uh, for, for, for millennia now because it is just so convenient. But it has some limitations, which is that uh, water boils at 100 Celsius, which means that a lot of the really interesting aspects of uh, cooking, which is particularly the Maillard reaction, for example, which happens only from 110 Celsius and above, or caramelization, which happens at 160, or deep frying, uh, those kind of effects which you can get only at above 177 Celsius, which means that uh, you're missing out on all of those when, you're, when, when your cooking medium is only water, right? That is where uh, a pressure cooker comes in, right? A pressure cooker essentially uh, operates on the principle that at a high enough pressure, typically one bar more, one bar above just your average uh, atmospheric pressure anywhere outside, that the boiling point of water increases to 121 Celsius, right, or about 250 Fahrenheit, which means that in a pressure cooker, water will still be liquid and you can reach 121 Celsius, which in an open pot, you can't because at 121 Celsius, all your water is already boiled off and you can't really cook anymore, right? So inside a pressure cooker, that's the advantage. In fact, there are industrial grade uh, pressure cookers that can that can apply even higher pressure. So you can actually cook even up to 140 and 150 Celsius, uh, achieving even more interesting uh, flavor profiles uh, while you pressure cook, right? So the second advantage of a pressure cook, uh, pressure cook environment is the fact that because you're able to apply a higher temperature while still cooking in water, you can cook things faster. Right. So which is why otherwise uh, you would take, uh, you know, 20 or 30 minutes to cook rice on an open flame uh, or literally take days and hours and months to cook uh, things like chana. Uh, obviously, I'm exaggerating. But uh, but when it comes to uh, pressure cooker, you can cook all of these in under 15 minutes, uh, 10, 15 minutes and so on. Right. So first thing to understand is that 
pressure cooking should not be measured measured in whistles but it should be measured in time at peak pressure here's what happens right when does the whistle go off the whistle goes off when it reaches peak pressure and it's a a way of releasing excess steam so that the cooker can come back to slightly below dangerous levels of pressure and the next time the pressure builds and goes above that threshold the weight exists as a safety mechanism it's a simple weight uh, and then once the pressure increases uh, uh, to more than its weight uh, the weight of the actual uh, thing that you put on top it will go up and it will release the steam and the once the pressure goes below gravity come back you know uh, so that, that the weight will fall back right so that's how the principle works so the 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 time between whistles is a function of how much heat you apply at the bottom okay and as long as we were only using standard you know typical indian you know two burner type stoves all of them put out a largely average same amount of heat at, at the same setting of you know high heat uh, medium heat and sim right uh, and so therefore this entire you know subculture of measuring by number of whistles worked because everybody was operating at the same amount of heat from their burners unfortunately now we many of us are starting to use induction burners some of you are using electric burners and both of these actually put out way more energy a way more heat than your flame that uh, that your average burner puts out right and so what this does is that at 2000 watts your induction stuff will heat a pressure cooker at such a rapid pace and by the way you can try boiling water on a regular stuff on an induction stuff the induction stuff will boil it in in 30 percent less time right at maximum heat and that's the reason why if you go by a recipe that says cook for five whistles and you use an induction stuff you will end up with an undercooked product for the simple reason that cooking happens in a pressure cooker based on how much time the food has spent after peak pressure has been reached when do you reach peak pressure once you start the pressure cooker you know seal the lid put the weight and turn it on it will take a few minutes for it to reach the peak pressure and that's when the whistle goes off right the second thing here is that if you buy an instant pot or an electronic pressure cooker you never hear a whistle anywhere so you really hand and that's the future so in any case you have to start to think in terms of the amount of time that it spends after the first whistle which is why here's how you really find out if people on youtube know what they're doing which is that if they tell you that you turn on the pressure cooker wait for it to come to a first whistle reduce the heat to sim and measure the amount of time and say that wait for five minutes if somebody says that they know what they're doing right so you might want to pay attention to recipes that are able to give you instructions that way so that's number one the second interesting thing is that uh, because you can now cook at 121c you can also achieve the maillard reaction inside a pressure cooker right historically you're only boiling food so you're not actually browning food in fact if you're browning something in the pressure cooker chances are it's probably getting burnt but you can do interesting things for example if you want to make french onion soup or caramelized carrot soup right or beetroot soup uh, add very little water because these vegetables have enough water uh, and a pinch of baking soda to increase the ph and also accelerate the maillard reaction which means that you can actually make french onion soup by just uh, browning onions in your pressure cooker otherwise that would take you actually 30 or 40 minutes on the stuff to get a perfect consistency for making french onion soup outside but you can actually try this inside a pressure cooker as well right and the other thing you know let's say you forgot to soak your chickpeas you forgot to soak chana um, and all of a sudden you have a craving for uh, chana masala no worries just take your ch raw chana um, add a pinch of baking soda um, and then you can actually cook uh, in uh, in 30 minutes at peak pressure in a, uh, in, a, in a pressure cooker right so again these are many things that you could do in a pressure cooker right so the critical thing at least from the point of view of a cooker is to understand that different things uh, different things that you want to cook different lentils different vegetables all of them have different times in which they get cooked right and again for lentils it also varies by whether you are soaking the lentils and it also varies by whether once you've switched off the pressure cooker do you just open the weight and release the excess steam right away which is the quick release or 
you do a natural release, which means that you wait for it to uh, uh, lose the pressure all by itself before you switch on the pressure cooker, which is something that you might do if you're cooking something else, you let the uh, you let the cooker have a natural release as well. So, so you can see each of these times and just for the sake of simplicity I've marked which ones are ones that Indians are familiar with, Rajma, Chana, uh, various kinds of Chana Dal, chickpeas as well as your Bengal gram as well. You have Tur Dal, you have Moong Dal uh, as well. And as you can see, Moong Dal is something that cooks in basically four to six minutes, right? Which is about the time that most vegetables take. Uh, so let's see vegetables now, right? Uh, and I have linked to the, uh, in the previous deck, uh, the previous slide, I have linked uh, to the website that has, that will give you an accurate estimate of how long you should pressure cook anything, right? Uh, so when it comes to pressure cooking vegetables, it's, it's a function of how small the pieces are or how large the pieces are and the desired texture, right? Do you want it to be completely smashed or you still want it to have a little bit of bite? Uh, and it'll depend entirely on that. So if you're pressure cooking something for just a minute, the sorts of things you can do, sliced cabbage, very thinly sliced carrots, you know, you, you, can, you can use just a minute of pressure cooking. Two minutes, uh, most non-starchy vegetables that are cu cut into sort of chunks will cook in two minutes. Three to five minutes, starchy vegetables, potatoes, yams, and so on, sweet potatoes, tapioca, and so on, but cut into relatively small chunks, right? Five to seven minutes, obviously starchy vegetables in large chicks. Uh, uh, sometimes even whole potatoes that are not too big, right? Will all, you, you can do this in five to seven minutes, right? Now, again, um, there will be variations uh, between pressure cookers on how much pressure, but in general, uh, modern day pressure cookers all tend to operate at the one bar uh, pressure. Uh, the older pressure cookers may not, but this still broadly applies. And I think you can experiment in your homes, whatever pressure cooker you have uh, and figure this out, right? Uh, just to remind you of another uh, bit of principle that I spoke about in the previous uh, uh, talk as well, which is that what spices should you use uh, in your cooters, right? Typically look at what kind of flavor profile you want and what mix of flavor profiles you want. Uh, and then you pick the combination of spices uh, and you can try different ones. Uh, and you can get a different regional flavor. In fact, uh, uh, every region in India often is associated with a certain mix of spices, right? So if it's if it's garlic, fennel, shallots, and curry leaves, it is it is chetina, right? Um, it is uh, garlic, curry leaves, uh, coconut. Uh, in coconut oil, then it sort of has a very balabar or Kerala type feel. And if it's mustard oil and panchforan, which is kalonji, ajwain, uh, mustard, uh, uh, fenugreek, and so on, you get a very Bengali uh, sort of feel. So again, you pick the spices that you want uh, to get the kind of flavor profile that you need, right? And you can mix and match as well, right? Um, so I want to give you some uh, broad tips when you're actually making kutu, which is that uh, kutu is one of those dishes where you can go from ultra mild to little or no flavor to, to flavor bomb, right? So um, if you want an ultra mild flavor, then just pressure cook the, the lentils and veggies, add salt and just temper. That's all you need to do for the ultra mild flavor, right? Um, if you want a slightly mild flavor, then you pressure cook dal, veggies and salt. Uh, and in your tempering, you might want to add a few more things. You might want to add chilies, you might want to add curry leaves and so on. In fact, the ultra mild is, uh, is something that will be typically made for people who have like upset stomachs or uh, very sensitive stomachs and do not want anything spicy, right? Uh, if you want a little bit more flavor, you basically add more things to the tempering. If you want a more medium flavor, uh, it's not uncommon for people to add onions and garlic in the pressure cooker itself uh, when you're cooking dal and veggies. Uh, because as I said, again, boiling stuff gives you a milder flavor profile than if you fry the, you know, the onions or garlic in oil, which gives you a stronger flavor, right? Uh, if you want a medium high flavor, you oil roast spices, grind to a paste with coconut as we saw, and then you add to the dal veggies. And if you really want a mega intensely flavored one, you can saute the base of onions, garlic, add the boiled dal and veggies, add the spice paste, and also do the tempering, right? And if you really want to go whole hog, add a little bit of a tamarind juice or tomatoes, the acid as well, and that will essentially just amplify every, every other taste. Uh, so that you get something uh, a lot more uh, closer in flavor profile uh, to a sambar or a kurumba, but that's okay, right? I mean, it's none of these are hard and fast rules. Feel free to try uh, anything. Now, here's where obviously, you know, uh, 
some of you may think this is sacrilegious, but uh, uh, here are some ideas on how to step off the tra tradition bandwagon. I mean, if you're happy with the traditional recipes, if you're happy with the usual ways in which uh, people make these, that's perfectly fine. You can use these methods to try and experiment and stick within those bounds. Uh, but then again, right? I mean, I mean, if you're willing to experiment with a different oil, perhaps use coconut oil or perhaps use a different spice. I mean, why not just expand your uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, perspective to in a global sense and, and try other sort of uh, uh, ways of infusing flavor uh, to your uh, kutu, right? Uh, here's how you can take it to the next level, right? So you can add monosodium glutamate uh, at the end. It will uh, lend a lovely savory uh, taste profile because glutamates, that's what they do. They give you that sort of uh, savory uh, mouthfeel uh, and that's exactly what MSG will do. And MSG is perfectly safe. Anybody who tells you it's not safe, it's being pseudoscientific. Okay, uh, second one. Um, you could also, and by the way, the first couple of suggestions are all vegetarian suggestions, and then I'll give you the regular suggestions. Okay, uh, you can also, by the way, powdered mushrooms is a fantastic condiment. Okay, uh, it really adds. Uh, if you don't like unnatural chemicals like monosodium glutamate, you know, chemicals in double quotes. Ultimately, all food is chemicals. Uh, you could also use powdered mushrooms, which again are loaded with glutamates, or you could actually make the kutu with mushrooms itself, right? So you. You maybe sort of uh, saute the mushrooms in oil, add your cooked uh, dal, uh, and then um, and then temper, right? And so you also get the umami flavor of the mushroom itself, right? Or use powdered mushrooms. Um, you could try other kinds of garnishes. Uh, it doesn't have to be curry leaves and uh, coriander all the time. You could garnish with basil, parsley, uh, and other kinds of flavors uh, that sort of work together, right? Uh, also, there's nothing stopping you from trying an entirely Italian flavored kuta. Sort of start with an olive oil. Uh, maybe sort of add uh, uh, garlic and tomato. Then you add your mung dal uh, and perhaps an Italian vegetable like say zucchini, uh, uh, some, some such thing, which makes for an excellent kutu by the way. Um, and then in your uh, tempering, uh, uh, you could use, uh, for garnish, you could use things like rosemary and so on, because again, to add to the Italian theme. So we know that these sort of flavors work together in Italian cuisine. You know, there's no reason they won't work for you uh, when you actually make a coup to that sort of Italian, you know, in, in, in its, in its uh, you know, makeup. Right? Um, another interesting thing, one of my favorite uh, flavor bombs I've seen is, is something from Mexico, but also very common in the U.S. or at least the southwest of the U.S. is adobo sauce, is jalapenos, uh, chipotle chilies in ado uh, adobo sauce. So dried jalapenos are called chipotle chilies. They're typically smoked. Um, and they are soaked in this incredibly rich tasting adobo sauce, which incidentally, among other things, also has cumin and many other spices, right? So all you could just take is a bunch of jalapenos and adobo sauce and grate it with coconut and use that as your spice paste. And, uh, you know, that will make for an astonishingly tasty uh, kuta. And you just use any vegetables you need, maybe even cabbage, you know. Right, so that's that's one way of maybe making a Mexican style uh, kuta, right? Uh, now let's get to some regular normal suggestions. Uh, this is obviously inspired from Southeast Asia. Uh, shrimp paste, di dried shrimp, dried anchovies, canned anchovies, um, or in Tamil Nadu even dried uh, karuvadu, all uh, make for fantastic uh, addition of umami uh, to any dish. Right? You could use this on any dish, but particularly in a in a more milder, subtler flavor profile like this, this will really stand out, right? Um, you know, I suppose you could add shrimp paste to making sambar, but sambar is already a phenomenally intense flavor profile and you don't want to sort of, you know, the, di the knob is already at 10 and you don't want to dial it up to 11 by adding shrimp paste, right? So this is a perfect use case for using shrimp paste or dried shrimp, dried anchovies or canned anchovies, right? Um, the other thing you could experiment is if you have fish sauce, and you should if you don't already have it, it's a fantastic way to add salt and umami at the same time, right? So fish sauce is basically soy sauce on steroids. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, when you add a small bit, if you're worried about the smell of fish, no, you won't get the smell of fish once you actually add it to the dish itself. The sauce itself will smell fishy, but once you add it to a dish, it adds a fantastic uh, umami flavor boost as well, right? Uh, again, also when you're pressure cooking, uh, whatever it is with mung dal or tur dal and vegetables, you know, throw in some bacon bits, right? Uh, these again add a tremendous amount of flavor uh, to anything that you cook, right? So thank you.